Welcome back. Now for the news in detail, we start from Iran, which says it will not take part in any negotiations for a new nuclear deal. Foreign Ministry spokesman Abbas Musavi says Tehran will only discuss issues pertaining to the current agreement. This comes after Iran said it will exceed its uranium enrichment limit under the 2015 nuclear deal today. Musavi says Tehran's uranium enrichment is within the framework of the deal as its Western signatories were not keeping their obligations. Earlier, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said a new Nuclear armed Tehran would even pose a greater danger to the world. Pompeo has called world powers to ensure Iran does not enrich uranium for its nuclear program. In Iraq, three more ISIS militants have been killed in a US led anti terror operation in northern Kirkuk province. Officials say US led airstrikes destroyed a militant hideout in the southern province. Meanwhile, one civilian has been killed and two others injured after ISIS militants attacked a village in eastern Diyala province. In Libya, three airline employees have been injured and a plane damaged after missile attacks on Tripoli's only functioning Mitiga airport. This comes hours after seven Moroccans were killed in an airstrike on a migrant center in the town of Tajora. Morocco's Foreign Affairs Ministry says eight people were wounded in Tajora, east of Tripoli. It says Rabat is working with the Libyan authorities for evacuating the wounded and repatriating bodies. Meanwhile, hundreds of migrants from Sudan, Ethiopia, Eritrea and Somalia protested against airstrikes. In fear of another attack, they demanded urgent evacuation. Sudan's army ruler General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan has pledged to implement the power-sharing deal agreed with opposition. Following the deal, protest leaders cancelled a nationwide day of civil disobedience later this month. After months of violent protest, the military and protest leaders have agreed to form a joint governing body to end the political crisis. The new governing body will be presided over by a military nominee for the first 21 months and the last 18 months by a civilian. <laughs> Thanks God for this success. Now we have reached the agreement, the agreement that we have been waiting for so long. That agreement needs cooperation and it needs all the trust of everybody so we can take this country forward. The deal was brokered by Ethiopia and the African Union. The military says the time has come to work together to move forward. Now we promise you and our brothers who we agreed with that from now. We need to move forwards and join our hands together and address each other so we can move this country forward because it has the resources to do so and those resources are in your hands. We need to take care of them and the country needs our efforts to move forward. 136 people have been killed since a military crackdown on protesters on June the 3rd. Meanwhile, in Yemen, a Houthi missile attack has killed at least seven pro-government soldiers in southern province of Talia. The Yemen's military says the missile targeted an armored vehicle of pro-government forces. It says intense fighting broke out between Houthi rebels and government forces after the attack. This comes as Houthi fighters try to recapture key military sites they lost in previous battles with the pro-government forces in Talia. Now, in Saudi Arabia, King Salman and British Finance Minister Philip Hammond have discussed the prospects of listing Saudi oil giant Aramco in the international stocks by 2021. Saudi Arabia hopes to raise $100 billion by selling up to 5% shares of the world's largest energy firm. The kingdom is yet to announce the place of listing, but London, New York and Hong Kong stock exchanges have all vied for a slice of the much-touted plan. The plan is envisaged by Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to lessen Saudi's economic reliance on oil. The two leaders also discuss ways to strengthen economic and financial cooperation. 
They also reviewed security matters in the wake of alleged Iranian threats to regional waterways. Venezuela's opposition has agreed to restart talks with representatives of President Nicolas Maduro's government. Norway's government will mediate the negotiations which will be held in Barbados this week. Opposition leader Juan Guaido says the Norway brokered talks aimed at negotiating an end to Maduro's dictatorship. He says Venezuela's people and allies recognize the need for a free and transparent electoral process. Meanwhile, two of Venezuela's largest oil refineries have halted operations following a blackout. The train refineries together process more than 900,000 barrels of oil per day. Greece's centre-right opposition party New Democracy has won the nation's snap general elections. With most districts counted, Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras conceded defeat in his rival Kyriakos Mitsotakis. More in this report. Greek Conservatives, led by Kyriakos Mitsotakis, have scored a landslide victory in the country's snap polls. The New Democracy Party won most votes, beating the ruling Syriza Party. An emotional Tsipras conceded defeat and congratulated his opponent. We fought and achieved a lot, always with our head held high. And today again, with our heads held high because we know that the Greece we hand over to the, new, to the new government has nothing to do with the Greece we took over. Mitsotakis called on people who had left during the country's financial crisis to return home. Of course our discussions with our European creditors uh, will, uh, will begin immediately, but uh, we've made our plan very, very clear. There are no real surprises here uh, involved. Uh, we want to drive uh, a real reform agenda for, uh, for the country that is uh, ambitious, uh, very bold and very, very detailed. Uh, and of course, we've made a case that uh, lower primary surpluses will be to the benefit of everyone. The government handover would take place on July 8, after Mitsotakis is sworn in as the new prime minister. Meanwhile, a complete shutdown is being observed across Indian-occupied Kashmir on the third anniversary of Burhan Vani's martyrdom. Vani was martyred by the Indian occupational forces in a fake encounter in occupied Kashmir on July 8, 2016. Occupation forces have imposed a curfew and other restrictions on the youth leader's anniversary. The son of a school headmaster, Vani became the iconic face of armed struggle in Indian-occupied Kashmir. He led the Kashmiri youth struggle against Indian occupation using social media as a channel. His martyrdom triggered the longest ever curfew in Kashmir, which was over a hundred days long. During the curfew, scores of people were killed and injured by occupation forces trying to suppress dissent. Rallies and meetings will be held across Azhar Jammu and Kashmir today to renew allegiance with Vani's freedom struggle. 29 people have been killed and 21 others injured after a state-run bus fell into a large drain near Agra. Police suspect the driver fell asleep before the double-decker flew off a bridge on its way from Lucknow to Delhi. Officials say the bus fell over 40 feet into a river which crossed the top deck. Around 900 people have been killed on the Yamuna Expressway since it opened in 2012. Official data shows India's roads are among the world's deadliest, where 150,000 people were killed in 2017 alone. Now, a group of 58 migrants have disembarked in a Valletta after they were rescued by Maltese authorities. The migrants were rescued by the charity service Alarm Phone. Maltese officials say all the migrants are in good condition. Meanwhile, another rescue boat with 65 migrants on board has not been given clearance to enter Maltese waters after Italy refused entry. Italy's migration policy has led to clashes with charity services over rules that close off the country's port to their boats. Moving on to the Philippines now, where the killing of a three-year-old girl in the ongoing anti-drug war has sparked a widespread outrage. More in this report. 
Over 12,000 Filipinos have been killed in President Rodrigo Duterte's drug war since 2016. 2,555 of the killings have been attributed to the Philippine National Police. The youngest person to get caught up in this carnage was three-year-old Namid Katilin. The senator who oversaw the drug war's most violent period as police chief has rushed off the child's death as collateral damage. Rules of engagement. Rules of engagement? Of course, you really need to secure things first so that there will be no collateral damage at all. But like I said, we are in an imperfect world. Police say Kati Lean was being used as a human shield by her father, a drug pusher. Twenty police officers have been suspended in the wake of the tragic encounter. But the victim's family says they are living in fear of the cops and has rejected the police's version of events. I'm a bit scared for myself because my enemy is not just anybody. I want to fight, but I ask myself how. As for my security, I'm afraid I may have to leave my children. On July 4th, Iceland presented a draft resolution to the UN Human Rights Council calling for action against extrajudicial killings in the Philippines. If passed, the council will request Human Rights Chief Michelle Bachelet to prepare a report on the human rights situation in the Philippines. The resolution has been backed by 28 countries. More news coming up after a break. Stay tuned. African leaders have launched a continental free trade zone at an African Union summit in Niger. The landmark free trade area agreement follows 17 years of tough negotiations. It was formalized after Nigeria announced it would join in. More in this report. 55 African nations joined hands to economically uplift the poverty-stricken continent. The African Union says the pact will lead to a 60% boost in intra-African trade by 2022. The free trade zone established on May 30th, 2019 is the largest exchange area in the world. Africa, with a population of 1 billion and 217 million people, will reach 1.7 billion in 2030 and 2.7 billion by 2050. Egypt's President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi says the agreement will help signatories to improve the living standards of Africans. The eyes of the world are turned on Africa and the success of the AFCFTA will be the real test to achieve the economic growth that will turn our people's dream of welfare and quality of life into a reality. This will reinforce our negotiating position on the international political and economic stages. Currently, trade among African countries stands at 16% in comparison to 65% with European countries. Meanwhile, South Korea has called on Japan to withdraw its curbs on export of materials used in chips and smartphone displays. Last week, Tokyo made it compulsory for companies to obtain permission for each batch they wish to send to Seoul. South Korea's finance minister Hong Nam Ki says the government will help minimize the damage for affected companies. Seoul has called the curbs a violation of WTO rules, saying it will respond firmly. South Korean tech giant Samsung and LG Electronics are likely to be affected by the new restrictions. Germany's struggling Zürich Bank is cutting 18,000 jobs over three years as part of a radical reorganization. Zürich says it will significantly shrink its investment banking business by the year 2022. Deutsch says the restructuring will cost the bank over 7 billion euros over three years. 
the bank is yet to specify which country's operations will end up losing the most jobs. But it says it intends to completely end buying and selling of shares in London and New York. With almost 8,000 staff members, London is home to the bank's biggest trading operation. The reorganization follows the failure of merger talks with the rival Commerce Bank in April. Now, Asian stock markets have fallen after strong U.S. jobs data tempered expectations for a Fed rate cut. Mainland Chinese shares slipped significantly. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index and Japan's Nikkei 225 also dropped. In South Korea, the Kospi declined following tightening tech exports curbs by Japan. Australia's ASX 200 declined marginally. The U.S. dollar index surged, while the Turkish lira hovered near the two weeks' lows on worries about central bank independence. Oil prices rose in the Asian trading. Meanwhile, Algeria and Madagascar have advanced to the quarterfinals of the Africa Cup of Nations. Algeria cruised to a 3 0 victory over Guinea, while Madagascar edged Congo on penalties by four to two shots. Striker Yosef Beleli put Algeria ahead by striking the first goal in the 24th minute of the match. The Manchester City striker Riyad Mahrez extended the lead with a close-range finish. Adam Onus sealed a one-sided victory with a third goal late in the second half. Africa Cup of Nations debutants Madagascar caused another upset to beat Congo 4-2 on penalties. The game remained tied at 2 all till the end of the second extra time. Both teams' players scored one goal in the first half. Madagascar regained the lead, but Congo's Chancel Mpeba's 90th minute equaliser forced extra time. Madagascar scored all their penalties, while Congo missed two and lost the match. The United States beat the Netherlands to retain FIFA Women's World Cup title. The U.S. co-captain Megan Rapeno kept her good from going, as she guided her team to the fourth World Cup crown. The defending champion dominated the first half, but could not find a way past Dutch goalkeeper Sari van Venendel. The U.S. kept the possession in the second half as well, which earned them two goals to seal the title. Rapine opened the scoreline in the second half, eight minutes before Rose Lavelle doubled their lead. The 34-year-old finished the tournament with six goals and three assists. She won the Golden Ball and Golden Boot for her overall performance, as well as for the top scorer of the event, respectively. England's Lucy Bronze finished runner-up to Rapone, earning the Silver Ball Award. More sports news to follow after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Now, the three-day Shandur festival kicks off at the world's highest polo grounds in Pakistan's northwestern Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. Hundreds of foreign and local tourists have arrived to proceed to the venue of the festival. Shandur polo ground is situated in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa at an altitude of 12,000 feet above sea level. The polo ground is also called as the roof of the world. Six polo matches between the teams of Chitral and Gilgit Baltistan are the major events of the festival. Other traditional games and cultural shows have also been included in the itinerary of the festival. The festival will end on July 9th. Now we are joined now from Chandur in the Karakoram Mountains by our correspondent Kiran Bud. Hello Kiran, you must be enjoying yourself. Yeah, hi Maniba. Uh, it is a fun festival here, and the festival was inaugurated by uh, inaugurated was inaugurated by uh, yesterday by uh, starting the match. And General Rahat Nasim Ahmed threw the first ball of the match, and there was a uh, physical team 
who won by eight goals. And uh, Chief Minister uh, Khyber Pakhtun for Mohammad Khan was the chief uh, guest of that event. And uh, 0.1 million tourists are expected to attend the final fair. And uh, the enthusiasm of the cheerleaders are very good, and they are supporting their respective teams. Gilkit Baldesan and Chitral are traditional rivals, and Chitral is being winning this game uh, for last six years. So the pressure is really on Gilkit Baldesan team to uh, win this match and uh, our tournament. All right, Kiran. So, um, Kiran, yeah. tell us what can the tourists look forward to seeing during the tournament? There is cultural night uh, uh, prepared uh, today, like tonight, uh, there will be a cultural night, uh, traditional dances, there are folk music uh, festivals and uh, stores have been set of traditional jewelry, food and clothes and foreign tourists are having a great time and uh, they are hoping that the festival end with a, a real enthusiasm and a real fun. And Kiran, are there plans to expand the scale and participation of the Shandur festival? Uh, I think we lost contact. So we'll get back to this when we have. Uh, thank you, Kiran, for being with us. And right after this, the weather update is coming up next. Well, that's all for now. For more news and updates, keep watching Indus News.